Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. My guests today coming to us from down under, from Australia, Alicia and Jared Kircher. Welcome to my fam- to my channel. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So I met Alicia at Walk Meeting Live. And within two seconds, basically, I understood that I cannot just talk to her. I have to talk to both of you. Let's go, <laughs> let's start with that love story because you both like very integral part of this business. How did you two meet and how did you come up with the idea of this business? <laughs> do you want to go or do you want to go? I'll, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> so so uh, back way back when, when we actually met, uh, we were both working uh, construction. I was, uh, and then we were both working for the same company, a uh, company called Downer here in Australia. Um, both working on the same project, building a rail line um, in Central Coast, New South Wales. And uh, actually, it was a bit of a love-hate relationship to start off with because uh, Alicia was an environmental scientist and I was a uh, construction and commissioning engineer. So we kind of butted heads every step of the way because she was trying to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. And she was trying to, uh, at the same time, trying to, to get me to clean up my act, which I actually learned to do, which I was, I was um, uh, browbeat into line on that, I guess. Uh, but we ended up actually... Uh, catching up for um, yeah, a few meals and drinks and it kind of all went from there. Um, then skip forward to, to many years later. Um, so our daughter, um, it was born and um, Alicia decided after many years of working in the construction industry that um, it wasn't quite for her anymore. So having a bit of a cup of tea on the back deck, um, we discussed options about what Alicia wanted to do next. And part of that was the starting of one of our other companies, Grumpy Ginger Yarn Co., um, which is a retail store here on the Central Coast. Um, and the, from there, um, Alicia came to me uh, one night before Christmas in 2022 um, with a Hey Jared, I've got an idea, which never ends well for me <laughs> or us. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always leads to more work. Um, and she saw that Great Southern, um, which is a company that she'd followed for many years and had, we had, or well, I had personally, so I don't knit at this stage, um, but she'd been following for many years, uh, knitted with their products and loved their, um, what they produce, was uh, reaching out to a few people to see if they were interested in taking over the business due to health reasons. So we had a bit of a chat about that um, and it kind of seemed very complimentary with the grumpy ginger um, that we already had with the retail side of things and that this was now um, the production of yarn. Um, and then, so we, we bit the bullet and we, we moved forward with procuring uh, great Southern and uh, which also came along with a, a lot of other things such as, you know, the production of yarn, like we, we actually do from farm right through to the skein. Um, so it was, that became a very interesting process. Um, and as we move through that um, and that journey itself and meeting with the farmers and then integrating with the mill and producing the products, et cetera, to be able to get back here to be able to dye, um, the products that we were getting back from our mill and the base that we're producing was of such a, a phenomenal quality and, and the softness um, that, the, the local industry and other dyes who we deal with all the time hadn't seen anything like it. So our idea to why hide this for ourselves, um, why not you know, open this kind of beautiful product to the greater industry and make awareness of you know, the SRS Merino with the, the non-milsing um, and make that available to the general industry. So right. on top of Great Southern Yarn, we decided to start Cacelli Textiles, which is for the naked base. So, And that's how we're here. So how many companies are we running right now all together? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> There's four in total. So we've got an engineering business and we've got the three um, fiber-based businesses. Yeah. Right. Well, let's talk about your engineering because that environmental engineering degree basically stays with you. And I feel like the whole muscling, uh, importance of non-muscling yarn for you comes from there probably I mean that's my guess that you 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 very like when we talked for like you know we, we were having drinks at vlog meeting and we were having pizza and we were chatting 
and it was obvious that like the whole local sustainability of wool is very important to you the treatment of the animals is very important to you tell me that discovery that process how did you learn about all of that and when it became like so important it definitely became important when we took over Great Southern Yarn and it was working out where we were going to source our fibre from um, and getting a product that met the standard that we wanted but met our ethics and our ethos of our business, being Australian, um, being a quality product, but being good to the environment so everything I've always done I've always considered the environment and particularly when it comes to animals and the treatment of animals um, so when we discovered that we could source the fiber from the SRS um, uh, merino sheep we knew that that was a better option because um, the molding process is really quite cruel um particularly well, with the way let's that... talk about it because not everybody is aware like of what are we talking about right so tell tell us like tell the viewers more about it what's the what it is that we are discussing right now okay so molesing is um basically the removal of the bottom of a sheep um and they they cut it down to skin or below skin level um they don't generally speaking not always but generally speaking they don't use an antiseptic they don't use any pain relief um they literally they will essentially scalp the sheep and then release them back out to the paddock now the importance and the reason why they do that is because of fly blown and um other diseases and issues around that area whereby in Australia particularly with the climate it gets very hot and things like that when they get fly blown it kills a sheep so it's a bit of a double-edged sword really you can either not mules and you'll lose your sheep to fly um, blown or you can mules the sheep and generally speaking they will survive the process it's just cruel um with the SRS Merino, um, they've been um, bred to have what they call a soft rolled skin. So SRS stands for soft rolled skin. So that means that they don't suffer with the fly blown. They don't have the hair. They don't have the rolls where all the fecal matter can sit in their skin where it attracts flies and things like that. The other thing that we do with the sustainable farming is we only have we only use the fiber from the males in our mob we don't have any females in our mob um, and the reason being is they're not crutching um, the females need to be crushed for their health um, we certainly have plenty of them on the farm we keep them for breeding purposes primarily um, for genetic diversity and things like that. So we need the females to maintain the genetics and that kind of thing. But we maintain that we only use the males because we like to let our fibre go that little bit further, which is where Jared comes in because you've dealt more with the fibre length yeah. and quality. Okay, um, so, so tell us about as far that. As we do the shearing. Um, standard shearing length for, for most sheep is two inches or 50 millimetres. So that in itself on a standard merino arrangement where you've got a fairly medium to high micron counts of, you know, 30, 40, 50 um, is fine. And so what happens with that is you've got the shorter fibre length, but because of the higher micron count, it's a stronger fibre. Um, but what that does lead to is where you get your scratchier wool versions. So basically micron count is the, the diameter of the, the fibre itself. So the smaller the diameter, the softer the wool, but the issue with small diameter and small micron fiber is its um, strength and breakability. So just like any kind of uh, fiber or wood or anything like that, the smaller that you put in the diameter, the more likely it is to break under pressure. So with the SRS Merino, because of the specific crimp that is uh, part of the breed, so it's another unique factor with the SRS Merino, the, the crimp, which looks like it's um, almost Rastafarian hair when it, it's shorn from the sheep, um, 
allows us to shear up to 100 mil or four inches deep, which means then that the we're getting the same um, strength due to the extended length of the, the nap itself with the tiny micron. So our micron is anywhere from 12 to 17 micron, um, which is why the, the base itself is so extremely soft. Um, but that combined with the long um, nap length and that crimp, which is in the fibre, allows it to be quite a strong merino blend still. So that when you, it's, you know, because we do not super wash, it's still not machine washable or hardy in that sense, but it's not going to pill and break and, um, and fray straight away. So we gain all that strength, but also gain the softness. Well, Alicia, I know that you are a knitter and you know your yarn. Jared, how did you learn about yarn? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, usually what would happen, um, so we, number of things. So it would either be um, uh, of a night time, I'm relaxing um, on a job after a big day and I would play, you know, PlayStation or work or something and Alicia would be knitting. Um, or these days, it's usually that we we end each night with you know a cup of tea uh, shared together and a leash or knit. Um, but it's it's one thing that my family um, have always been very crafty, like my mother, grandmother, um, aunties, etc. So always been in and around the fiber arts. Um, I can actually sew on a button and I can patchwork and I can use the sewing machine, which is better than what this one can do. <laughs> um, but I can, I, look, I can finger knit, uh, but I haven't knitted to this stage. And I've told Alicia that uh, if she ever wants to have that happen, that she needs to um, organise some kind of uh, charity um, fundraiser and that if she raises $5,000, then I will uh, go and knit on camera in public and you can teach me and use it for whatever <laughs> socials you need to. So oh, that's a bit of a next step challenge for her. I think it's, I think it's well achievable, but uh, to date um, it's just not eventuated. So I know that you guys have a lot of wool available around you, but once he learns how to knit, he's coming for your stash. You have to keep <laughs> it there, right? Well, Maybe that's a reluctance. <laughs> well, it, it's already that, like, even when I, I'm traveling for work um, uh, and I, I do go to all different yarn stores across the world, um, you know, to, to, to discuss with them about our companies, but also so that I can pick out something nice for Alicia. Um, and some of the comments are that I'm picking better for her stash than she is these days, <laughs> um, which I think it's not a bad thing for that one, but it's, yeah, it's, it's something I never thought that I would be interested in. Um, my job uh, of a like nine to five job is is very technical. Um, I think the fiber arts, um, doing the work with the the creative side of life as opposed to structured management, um, you know, detail orientated, um, being able to do the dyeing as well for Great Southern is a very good creative outlet for myself, uh, and I'm really enjoying it. So it's it's great and. Alicia and I work really well as a team, uh, except for when we don't sometimes, um, but usually that's not very often. So, Well, I wanted to ask you, like one another thing that we touched on um, back in New York was the surprising fact that like, even though the merino is grown in Australia, most of the raw wool is shipped outside of Australia to be processed and milled. Talk to a little bit about that. Um, so there's a few factors with that. Um, one of them is the the volume that we're producing. So um, I think our last shipment was 10 tonne. Uh, that was eight. So eight, eight tonne of um, raw merino wool um, shipped across to our mill. Um, so we're doing really large quantities of fibre. Um, and here in Australia the bigger mills are at capacity already. So when we came on board, we had already been sort of, um, their books were already closed. So then we started to investigate how we could keep it within Australasia and that's where New Zealand came in. And New Zealand um, Design Spun and Napier, they've, they do a worsted spun, which was yeah. actually optimum and perfect for our fibre. Yeah. So we kind of... Um, I guess accidentally hit the jackpot with that in the sense that 
um, the mill and the milling process is perfect for the quality and the type of fibre that we're trying to process. Um, we're actually the, the last um, large-scale worsted mill uh, in the Australasian region. So, Well, can you um, explain about the worsted uh, versus the woolen spun? Like why, why is it perfect for your particular kind of wool? So your, your general woolen uh, spin that they do is where they, they do blending and then they do the carding and then they do the spin. So it's a, a fairly simplistic process. Uh, the worsted process um, is a lot more detailed uh, and produces a different outcome to your spin. Um, so the, it starts off the same with the blending and the carding, but then from there it goes through a preparation machine uh, and then it goes to combing and then there's post-preparation where the fibres are straightened um, and then it goes into a roving stage. So they produce a roving into tubs. And then from there, they spin the individual fibres and then into whatever blend that you need. So it for us and our fibre arrangement, uh, being that they are the long mat um, and they have the, the crimping on the fibre itself, which is natural, uh, with the several other preparation stages, it removes more vegetation from the yarn itself. So the yarn is basically vegetation-free where you do find on other um, yarn that's produced that has a natural vegetation in it still uh, and also the the fibers are straight so it does uh, it's softer and there's less pilling okay. well you know what blows my mind with you that like a lot of people do something I feel like you do everything pretty much like not only you deal with the wool with uh, you know like getting it into yarn right but then you wholesale the blank yarn, the un uncolored yarn, you color the yarn, you sell the yarn. I mean, it's like you're doing everything. Do you feel yeah. like it's too much ever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we do, but we love the process. Yeah. And I think we're very passionate about the process and um, very proud about the fact that we have the opportunity dealing with the farmer, the mill, and those relationships that we have, um, that we can develop such a superior and beautiful product um, and share it with everybody else. I mean, that's that's one of the biggest joys is that we can share it with the wider community. Um, yeah. When you sell wholesale and then you see what dyers do with your wool, how does that feel? Because you are dyers yourself as well. It's so exciting. It's, it's great. Right? Yeah. Seeing some of the the colorways and how some of these other dyes are using the wool, like it's um, we we sell in uh, 100 gram skeins and also our cones. So we the five comes back to us as cones, which is uh, one kilo cones. So most of our or, or the significant portion of our uh, dyes buy on the cone. So in that it's interesting. Some of them um, break it down into 25 gram minis. And have done mini sets, which have been really interesting. Um, also, it gives them the ability to do 25s and 100s for like sock sets. Well, they're doing 50s. Um, 50s. We've even had some people doing like 200s and stuff to, to do like special editions. Uh, really cool seeing the creative process of that. Like it's at the end of the day, um, you know, we dye, we have our specific blends of dye, um, and other people have their specific um, arrangements of dye and how they do it too. But we're all working with the same Lego bricks. We just put the kit differently together. So, And it's really cool to see what these other people come up with with the ideas. Um, oh. I think the recent stuff by Circus Tonic um, and Skip Rope um, and Three Trees have been just absolutely amazing what they've been bringing forward with it. Fluff and nonsense can't yeah. get their hands on it. I know, yeah. Just... Yeah, natural so fibre brilliant. arts has been great too. Like, so. To see the SRS Merino branding go out um, with these dyes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. And the fact that we're all using an Australian product. Yeah. Um, well, Australian really dye cool. is using an Australian product and it's getting out to the world too. So, you know, one of our dyes who was using the base just recently uh, started exporting it to America, which is just phenomenal. Like who would have thought that, you know, we could do something – like that that people love so much that they're selling it around the world it's just crazy yeah tell me about the learning process of dying because i talk to a lot of dyers and there is always some disaster stories of like oh, you know, yes. <laughs> microwavable <laughs> yes. aid tell me about yeah. your story of learning how to dye yarn 
we were incredibly fortunate in the sense that um, the previous owners of Great Southern Yarn did give us a big crash course when we bought over the business. Um, we were also fortunate in the sense that at least one of the previous dyers that had worked with Great Southern Yarn was happy to come on board. Um, and Catherine gave us a lot of tips, hints, is always yep. there on tap if we've got questions. She's very helpful, very resourceful. Yep. Um, also just... We have an amazing community here in Australia when it comes to dyers in the sense that whilst we all protect our IP and whatnot, we all very much talk about our challenges and what we're facing with dyeing the different bases, mm. um, different techniques that we're trying and using. Um, yeah, because you absolutely do. And a lot of it is also literally getting it wrong yeah. and working through the process of getting it right. Yeah, and it's even down to like the different equipment that we use. So like our our dye studio setup, we have um, gas cook, we have electric cook, we have um, indirect cook with like large heating ovens that we're moving towards as well. Um, and yeah, we have different scanning arrangements. We've got different drying arrangements, different preparation, um, and it's just a matter of um, like we we have a lot of success, um, which has come from a lot of failure. Um, yeah, the you go through and we'll use um, some, you know, even with getting these new bases on board, um, looking at, you know, where our first base that we started off with was uh, the SRS Merino 4-ply, um, which was a beautiful base. And we learned how to die with that. A um, lot of, you know, failures to start off with that with, you know, penetration into the centre of skeins or with variegation that was unintended or, you know, colour mix would not take the same as previous skeins on different bases. But even going to different plies on the same base um, takes the dye differently. Um, or going through and now introducing that the Merino Nylon blend takes the dye differently. So it's about realising that, well, first of all, we're a bespoke product. So you're never going to have it so that each dye lot is going to be exactly the same because we are not a commercial dye uh, mill. It's just not how it operates. But realising that you know, what we do produce when there is slight differences and slight, you know, changes of irrigation in it actually creates a lot of the beauty in the product too. So we, while we have had a lot of failures, um, a lot of them have been happy failures that have led us to greater successes. Yeah. One of the crazy things as well with that, Irina, is that um, whilst we're following the same recipes here in the dye studio, um, my technique is slightly different to Jared's technique, but we still get the same result. So it also comes down to that individual and yeah. um, what your process is, how, what works for you. Um, just like knitting, what is your process? How do you get to your end result? Um, so we even prioritise yeah. different dyeing. Like I, I tend to specialise in the, um, the semi-solid bases, um, whereas Alicia is more... Uh, flamboyant with the pan dyes um, and variegated colours. <laughs> so um, it's almost horses for courses, which means that, you know, we, we work in and around each other quite well in that sense. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because I cannot even imagine working with my husband. Like, I feel like we'll, we would be at each other's throat. So tell me how you manage to stay together, to stay in love, to stay peaceful and not to kill each other. <laughs> I think we definitely keep it real and we try to keep it fun. Um, we certainly like to crank the music. We very much have the same sort of style of music and interest in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, and learning what jobs we're good at and we stick to that. We communicate, but actually a lot of the time there's not a lot of communication happening. It's sort of, and just, I guess it's, an unwritten communication of, okay, what needs to be done next? And that person will just jump to those processes. Um, look, we definitely have our bunnies as anybody does. Um, but, yeah, most of the time it's, yeah, like I said, we sort of know our roles in the dye studio and um, it's a small space, but uh, we certainly know how to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> I think also a lot of the effort we put in at the front end to develop our processes um, because both of us coming from the industries we did were very process based. So making sure that, you know, identification of what we're doing, how we're doing it, getting the dye recipe sorted in, you know, legible arrangements, looking at, you know, how we manage the, the ordering system, 
Um, you know, Alicia is very much the the front end of things, and I'm very much the back end. But we worked quite well together. But also at the same time too, it's you know this is something which we enjoy. It's more of a, a fun task, and realizing that don't take it too seriously. Um, where we need help um, and where we need assistance, then we always talk and discuss and ask for that. Um, but at the same time too, it's you know keeping it light. You know, realizing that you know if we have to extend out by an additional day for a die run or something like that, or something didn't quite work, um, or life gets in the way, which it does when you uh, at every step of the turn having um, you know a young daughter and having other businesses and other matters and just life in general. Um, that you know this is something that we do for enjoyment. Um, yeah, it's yeah as much a hobby as it is a it uh, a business. Yeah, yeah. so. Well, when you think about the regular nine to five job, you come from the job and you don't want to even think about it. Like it's done till next day. When you're running yep. four businesses, you can't do that. Like it's just never ends, right? No. Do you get tired of that? That like all your thoughts and all your talks and all the conversations always about businesses? 100%. Yeah, but I think we also know how to have fun. We, um, we always check in on each other. Um, like one thing we've always prioritized, um, yeah, because I work away from work and then um Alicia's worked away from work as well before is we make sure that we prioritize us as a relationship. Um yeah, and even, family. Out, even outside of you know our family, um, yeah, same but different entities, but still making sure that there's an us. Um, so we prioritize things such as, you know, having date nights or even just catching up for lunch or catching up for you know, a coffee together or, you know, making sure you spend that time. So like one big thing that we do as a bit of a, a religious thing for us is every night that we are home, um, we'll, after we put our daughter to bed, um, we will uh, do a, a real pot of tea and we'll both sit down and we'll watch an episode of whatever show we're watching together. Um, and whether that's, you know, we're sitting on the, the bed and Alicia's knitting and I'm doing some work or I'm watching the television or whatever's happening at the time, we're still spending time with each other in each other's company. And I think that's really important um, and something that is overlooked a lot is that you, we just need to spend some quality time with each other where there's, you know, no expectation know anything else and it's just checking in on the other person going yeah how are you what actually really happened with your day not just paying lip service to it yeah and not necessarily always work either mm. like we do try to um you asked a question earlier on about how does he know so much about fiber i've been in his ear for the last 11 years <laughs> about fiber so he's had to learn because yeah. he's either not listening to me or uh, <laughs> right. yeah well talking about things you bring from work Let's talk about that yarn stash. Do you bring yarn home? How do you decide like what comes home and what you keep for yourself? Um, look, particularly with um, our retail store in the early days, yes, it was really hard not to just grab stuff and be like, oh, I love that. Um, I learned really quickly that I'm never going to get through it. And I also learned that the next one's going to come along and the next pattern's going to come along. Um, and so I've learned, except for when I travel, I'm terrible when I travel because it's a little bit more of a grab game. Um, but I have learned that particularly with our businesses that I have access to it all the time. Like, well, if I want something, I just go on diet. Um, yeah, so I've sort of learned not to be so greedy in that respect. Mm. You've kind of got the ultimate stash already by having shop <laughs> well <laughs> when, when, I, when i talk to people like there is two categories of people i find there are people who look at knitting as purely meditative and they want the simplest projects they don't want to think about it they just want to knit you know mm. stuck in that and around and like let the thoughts wander and then there are people like me who if i need something super simple my head is about to explode. Like I'm thinking about every single thing out there, like all the news and what have you, right? All the worries of the world. And when I'm knitting something super complicated, it's meditative to me. What kind of knitter are you? 
Um, more of the first one these days, mainly because when I do, I'm quite tired. So I find that um, I still like the complex patterns, but I have to be very fresh for it and have to be able to really switch off. Um, a lot of the time when I'm knitting these days, I'm on the run. So I'm, you know, at dance lessons or I'm at swimming or I'm so knitting in the round is really good um, for those kinds of things. But I do look, I do have a couple of little lace shawls and things like that. And I come in and go, like, I come and go from them. Um, but the day to day is just the whole, yeah, but I do switch off. I find it that I just, I can, it just relaxes and unwinds me. Um, yeah. Well, when you watch movies together, like I noticed when I'm watching movies with my husband and he's not a knitter, he just sees me doing whatever I'm doing. And, you know, it's like it's part of the background noise, let's say. We're watching movies together and he's going to be like, oh, my God, did you see that shawl she was wearing? <laughs> Jared, do you do that? <laughs> do you spot knitwear or wool every, every place you go and uh, every show you watch? Uh, not so much on movies or anything like that, but um, definitely you know, searching for yarn shops, uh, local yarn shops where we do travel um, and even without Alicia going in and seeing what other people are doing because um, generally interested in it in a, um, you know, professional sense but also like nowadays in a, in a personal sense in that I, I can see the artistry and what these people are doing and, and it's always interesting to see, you know, how someone else puts those colours together or, you know, how they're, yeah, their dye process and trying to, to guess at how and what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, it's I, I do admire, um, like, knitted wear itself when, you know, it's on display or someone goes, oh, have a look at this and, yeah, and looking at the the craft of it. Um, but it's, it's still not something which is 100% close to my heart in that sense yet. Being in this industry, it's like we're talking slow fashion, you cannot knit fast like you have to slow down you have to take your time you have to pace yourself basically like there is no other way around it do you find that you appreciate all the other craftsmanships around you like do you find that you spot them spot like the the slow fashion in other ways like you know the pottery i don't know like any any other craft yeah, I think we definitely do. I think, um, yeah, you definitely do develop an appreciation of the skill and the requirement that goes into even just a painting, which you think, oh, you know, I remember it's good painting. Painting, it just takes, you know, five minutes, doesn't it? Um, but, yeah, I think you do when you start to really look at it and I think you do look at items, paintings, pottery, that kind of thing, Um weaving I mean I love watching weaving um I cannot personally do it but the skill and the concentration that is required to go in it just amazes me it astounds me um yeah so no I absolutely do yes well yep. it's also like part of sort of like your heirloom right like all these skills like all the the weaving and the knitting it's part of the heritage and part of the culture and you basically by doing what you're doing you're becoming part of that history and part of that heritage do you ever think about that not in that context no <laughs> <laughs> um, it is interesting that you say that but because like in, in Australia especially, it's becoming a bit more of a, a re-emerging um, craft where people are relearning, you know, some of these old um, soft skills. And a, a lot of that was probably thanks to, to COVID and us being locked up for, you know, 87 years or whatever it was that we were. Um, and, like, so we're even finding, like, our, our eldest daughter um, loves to crochet. So she's – it's now becoming, like – you know, crochet fashion of, you know, crochet bags and tops and all these other bits and pieces, which looking around, um, you know, it's not something which we brought into that for her. That's something she's picking up externally. Um, but And it's really cool to see those kind of things being passed on to the next generation. Um, you know, myself, I, I enjoy woodworking and, and other bits and pieces um, where I dabble. And it's 
it's really encouraging that these skill sets are kind of continuing to the next generations where everything is very much instant gratification these days and also those skills of you know online people you know validate themselves by being good at you know a specific game online or playing screen time or something around that um, you know, having these physical crafts and still maintaining them into the future is a great thing. Yeah, and like even being able to sew the buttons, right? Yeah, yeah sew a button, exactly. <laughs> I think we're fortunate to, um, Irina, these days that we've got some remarkable designers out there who have made knitting, crocheting, weaving fashionable again. Like it's gone from, you know, your daggy old raglan jumper that Granny knitted you, which was just, you know, knitted into pieces and then sewn together and it was itchy and it was horrible. Um, you know, we've got some amazing designers out there that I think are inspiring people to go, oh, I want to do that now. Um, we have a lot of people that come into the retail store and that's quite frankly where the inspiration starts from is seeing these patterns out there going well i want to learn how to do that and then that's where their journey starts from or well, inspiration and education too yeah you, know, you don't have to use that you know spotlight ball of um, acrylic and come out right. with something you spend a lot of time on that um you know you just don't enjoy at the end of it well i also think that if you think about like my parents generation they were like after the second world war in eastern europe um knitting and crocheting and sewing it was part of the necessity like you only did that because there was nothing in the stores to buy you needed clothes you needed it it was cheaper to make clothes for your children than to buy it it was cheaper to mend things than to buy new things so all of that was like part of the culture of necessity and i feel like what makes crafts different now that it's it's almost came to the level of art, right? Like it became the fiber art. And I, I love that part. Like I feel like we're still carrying that heritage and that um, traditions of knitting and all those crafting skills, but we're bringing it to the next level. Yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. Yeah. And it's funny because my mom used to be, she used to knit, she doesn't knit now, but she's looking at what I'm doing and she's like, I think the wool is very different. Do you think the wool is very different now from what it used to be? Absolutely. I think um, our farming processes have improved. Um, I know specifically with our farm, the farming processes have improved, which we explained earlier on. Um, our mills have also improved and the quality of what we're getting out of our mills um, is far superior, um, even down to their processing. Um, the dyeing process, you know, so the damage to the fibres and the proteins and the fibres has changed a lot. Um, so by the time you get to your end product, yes, and I think there's also a lot more education in um, what bases and what fibres are appropriate for what products and how that garment should or shouldn't be worn. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter how beautiful and silky and smooth a merino is. If you start to sweat and you have merino direct on your skin, it's going to start to get itchy. And I think, you know, that education around, oh, maybe I should wear a singlet top or, you know, a T-shirt underneath that merino jumper so if I do get a bit sweaty, I can still wear the jumper and it won't get itchy. People are cottoning onto that and learning that it's not that as soon as it took, I mean, I remember my grandmother knitting me a jumper and even with a um, turtleneck underneath it, it was itchy. You don't get that anymore. Um, but, again, it comes down to selecting the correct fibre for the project that you're doing and I think that information is finally sort of more attainable for people. You look at it these days as well um, in comparison to like the, the food industry. Um, you know, food and sustenance you know, is a, a daily requirement uh, and where, you know, food in the olden days or, you know, previously used to be just about being fed. Yes, you can make something tasty, but these days if you look at gastronomy as a whole, um, a lot of the places and a lot of, um, you know, the, the top restaurants, it's about the experience itself. 
So people are, because they do have that disposable income, uh, are putting that money into the experience of food, but they're also putting that down to the experience of their, their yarn and their products. So, you know, same with the craft side of things back when, like you, you said before, with your parents knitting and stuff, um, they would have picked up knitting needles. So the knitting needles would have been plastic or metal or whatever could be attained at that point in time, but that was sufficient. Tick, we've got the knitting needles. These days you go through and you have a look and there is thousands of different variegated arrangements of knitting needles from different materials, metals, plastics, woods, um, everything, you know, every part of the spectrum on that, different sizes, weights, shapes, rounds, all these bits and pieces, there's so much more choice. And it's the same with the, the wool itself. Um, yes, you can still get your, your very basic cottons and your very basic acrylics and so all that kind of stuff, and they're more than sufficient to be able to knit pretty much anything you want to. But that choice of having that disposable income and also realising that it's, it's you know, you, you're putting a significant amount of time and effort into something like a, a jumper, for, which might take you, you know, six to nine, 12 months or something like that to knit in its entirety. Um, you want to enjoy the process of knitting it, but then also at the end of it, you want to enjoy what you've produced. So making sure that, you know, you're putting that, um, that effort into selecting the right wool. And also because of that, that's allowed the millers um, and the farmers, et cetera, to be a little bit more selective about what they're putting across and putting together, you know, better ideas on on better products. Um, and I think it's circular in that sense that the the more people are educated um, about the benefits and you know, uh, of the the better products, um, the more people seem to accept and and look at that and say, well, this is actually improving my crafting journey and and what I'm producing at the end of it. Um, yeah. It's it's a, once again a circular logic. Well, it's also, you know, we live in this humongous world, but it's also very small in this sense because of the technology. I think like we're having this discussion, it's uh, noontime in Australia and it's getting nighttime in Boston here and we're having this conversation. But it also allows you to see like all the products out there, learn techniques from dyers across the world, you know, from you and learn about all these different materials. How did it feel to come to Walk Knitting Life? What was that like for you? Um, scary and exciting all at once. <laughs> um, I was really excited about, I mean, I came as a participant just like everybody else. Um, I came in the hope that I would be able to, I guess, expose our product a little bit to the community over there. Um, knowing that that would be a challenge because I wasn't a vendor or I wasn't anything else. I, I purely participated. Um, but it was a real eye-opener, I think, more than anything else as to perhaps what we should be focusing the businesses on, um, what is the demand, where is the level of knowledge. So um that was a bit of an eye-opener to me. Um, I guess I had a few preconceptions leading into going to Vogue Knitting, um, such as people understanding what molesing was and things like that, um, to only discover that quite a few people didn't. Um, the level of, I guess, disclosure where we sort of have been very open and very honest with our product and how we source it, where we get it from, where we have it milled. Um, and that was a little bit daunting, telling people that we were taking our fibre to New Zealand as opposed to having it processed here in Australia was a little bit daunting. Um, we had to personally come to terms with that ourselves first and foremost um, prior to taking that to the wider community um, because I guess, like, we want to maintain an Australian product, um, mm -hmm. But we came to terms with the fact that, I mean, most Australians refer to New Zealand as a bit of a sister uh, sister island. So we came to terms with that it was going to be okay. Um, and we also learnt um, over time that it was a pretty standard thing for Australian farmers to do was to send their fibre to New Zealand to be processed. Um, a lot of it's got to do with the fact that they've got the scourers, um, they've got the big mills. They, they can just handle it where Australia, unfortunately, 
through the years and the generations, they've just, we've lost that. We've lost that portion of the industry and it's something that I think Jared and I became very passionate about with how can we bring that back to Australia and make that a thing. So going to Vogue Knitting was, um, yeah, like I said, it was a little bit scary sort of going to expose, I guess, the only thing that gave me comfort was knowing that I had a beautiful product or what I considered to be a beautiful product that I was proud of and wanted to share with as many people as I possibly could, um, you know, and I only took little samples over for everybody to to have a look at and things like that. Um, but, yeah, I hoped that it inspired, um, you know, other dyers, designers, um general public uh pretty much anybody that talked to me walked away with a bit of yarn candy um because i bought them my little candy sticks yeah. on the way over so um yeah it it was good in that respect it was exciting but yeah a little bit daunting well where do you see your business going from now like what's the plan what's the dream i hope to see Cachelli textiles really take off um I would love to see our fibre that we're producing go across the world. Like I would love to see it being used worldwide Um, and hoping that we can make it accessible um, and working through those processes with people to make it accessible worldwide. Um, Great Southern Yarn. Would love to see our dyed stuff in some of the the stores across the world. Um, It's already starting to make its way into some of the stores here in Australia. Um, But, yeah, really just want to see it, I guess, blossom and, you know, turn into into the brilliant product and branding that it is. Um, But, yeah, I don't want to just keep it here in Australia. We want to share it with as many people as we can. Yeah. Who comes up with the names for the hand dyed yarn? They were a legacy from the previous owner, believe it or not. Um, so we've maintained that. And the reason being is that was in respect to a lot of people that had supported Great Southern Yarn in the lead up to us purchasing it. So they even made up in regards to the Snowy, Snowy Mountains ranges here in Australia or they were named after Australian artists, um, whether it be the artists themselves or one of their paintings. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we we made that conscious decision at the start, given that we were, it's our primary catalogue of colours. Um, it was what people were used to, what people knew, um, and it became very evident very quickly that we couldn't change those names because I was having people come up to me and go, oh, such and such, you know, it could be artist studio or something like that, and they'd go, I want that colour, but they knew it by name. So it was very well known within the community that that was Great Southern and great what Great Southern's um, ethos was about, was about Australiana. Um, we've taken it into a slightly different and fun direction in the sense that um, we're working on a new range at the moment, which is going to be all of the um, 80s music (laughs) and 90s that we grew up with. Because as I mentioned before, we love music. So um, not that either of us can really play an instrument or sing, (laughs) but... (laughs) But we do love music, so we thought we'd have a little bit of fun with that and we're yeah. looking at doing an 80s range, which, again, trying to keep it Australian as much as possible, but, yeah. yeah. What's the most difficult thing about running all these businesses? Keeping all the balls up in the air. Um, keeping everybody, I guess, sort of feeling loved. Um, whether that be via email with the email communications and being conscious not to, um, and I've fallen victim to it quite a few times, opening up too many cans at one time. Um, sometimes it's I've learned it's okay to leave a little or two on a couple of cans <laughs> until you're ready to deal with them. Yeah. Um, 
because we do manage everything from, like we said, dealing with the farmer right through to end product. Um, we do all our own social media. We website, do website design. Everything, yeah. It's social media is probably the bane of our life at this point in time. Um, it's a necessary evil. Yeah, but it it's surprising how much energy and effort it takes up on top of everything else. Um, so that's for myself is probably my my biggest issue. Um, yeah, I think also like we we divide our our responsibilities effectively within the company um, quite well. And like I said, I do a lot of the back end, the e-commerce platforms, the websites, all that kind of stuff. Um, we also know when to kind of like put our hand up and say, I need help. Um, and in that sense, we've started employing um, like marketing companies and other bits and pieces to assist us with, you know, we, we've got it off to a great start, but taking it to that real next level uh, is where we'd like to get to. And that's all part of that dream of being able to get out there to everyone. But yeah, it's the keeping everything up and going and making sure that yeah, you're not lacking one area enough is a, a real issue. We also have an amazing team, um, a very small team, but amazing team behind yes. us. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I have a handful of girls that between teaching, retail, um, I mean, my retail manager yeah. would just, I'd be lost without her. Yeah. I couldn't do both knitting. I couldn't do the things that I do. Um, without those people and that support that we have, that we can sort of at times sort of tap out from that day to day and deal with that back end of the business management and the development and, um, you know, getting ourselves out there and the exposure of the business, we can actually do that and be out face-to-face -face meeting people mm -hmm. and connecting with people because um, otherwise I would be stuck in a stall. Yeah. Um, and people actually you know, five days a week. meet us and talk to us and see us in a sense like they they love the yarn and they love everything else but just being able to to meet and talk with us um and also being able to meet talk with them and just you know they they tell us about you know their their favorite yarn that they've purchased from great southern or you know how what they're going to plan to do with this stuff or you know the, the base itself and it, it's really cool that interaction with the industry uh to be able to do that a lot of people want to know our story um it's one of the biggest questions about the like the fiber and where we're sourcing it from and what the whys. Yeah. Um, we get a lot of questions about that. Yeah. Which is exciting. It's really cool. Well, I have another yeah. question. Why grumpy yeah. ginger? <laughs> um, believe it or not, our um, she was then too. Uh, daughter is a red hair, blue eyed little lady. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> yeah. and it was a play on words i wanted to name the shop after our daughter but wanted to protect her privacy um so it was a bit of a legacy to my daughter whilst not completely exposing her um but yeah little redhead blue eye yeah so you it's that's the logo as well is that it's that little kind of um, yeah, young person's face with the the knitting needles and the ball of wool on top, kind of thing, but still maintaining that ginger coloring. So, yeah. yeah. Do you think she's gonna join the family business? I'd like to hope so. She um already expressed inter interest, and if um anybody was to ever ask her uh, who owns Grumpy Ginger, she'll adamantly tell you that it's hers. Yeah. It's her shop. It's her business. It's so um, funny when she walks into the Grumpy Ginger and you know, people, oh yeah, hi, hi, how are you? And she's like, I'm the Grumpy Ginger. <laughs> and like everyone's like, oh okay, and then she's like, this is my shop. And, yeah, so well, she can she, she's she, really can she can definitely take over the social media. I'm sure. Oh, look, one day, hopefully <laughs> yeah. so. I hope so. <laughs> That's a dream. Uh, well, I want to thank you both for being my guest today. It was lovely hanging out with you. I can see the whole chemistry that you were mentioning. And Jared, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thanks so much. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank you, Irina, for having us. Thanks for having us. <laughs>